everyone. Welcome to our online Research Connections webinar this afternoon. It's really great to have you here. We're going to follow the usual webinar protocol and um, everyone will be muted and have their cameras turned off during the presentation. Uh, that's not to say we don't want to hear from you. We'd love to take your questions. And so during the presentation, you'll have the opportunity to post questions to slido.com using the event code connect2. Um, that's slido.com using the event code connect2. Uh, during the afternoon, uh, we'll, we'll be accepting your questions. Rico will be making a presentation and then uh, we will have some time for discussion at the end of his presentation. Before we get started, um, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Sydney Business School is located on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. The Gadigal people have been sharing knowledge, teaching and learning for thousands of years. And as we continue these practices within the business school, I would like to pay the respects of the university to the knowledge that's embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country and offer my respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which we meet today. The Research Connection series of which I said is, this is the second webinar in the series. The goal of this uh, series of webinars is to help our undergraduate and postgraduate students connect with the important research scholarship that the business school conducts that informs innovative business practice, regulation and policy, not only in Australia, but around the world. This afternoon, we're going to join a discussion led by Professor Rico Merkert on airline strategy in a post-COVID world, back to the future, a topic that is of great interest to, to everyone here this afternoon and to me personally. It's a great pleasure to welcome Rico to give this presentation. Rico is Professor of Transport and Supply Chain Management and Deputy Director of the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies here at the Business School at the University of Sydney. Rico has devoted his research career to investigating the economic impact of transport infrastructure, understanding performance measurement and management strategy in that field. And as well as working with leading universities around the world, Rico has also engaged and collaborated with major government groups and with industry, including Transport for New South Wales and Talis Group. All of us must remember that one of the most first and most striking effects of the COVID pandemic uh, following the border closures was felt by the aviation industry. I live in Mascot in Sydney, not far at all from the airport. And since March, I've been adjusting to a very unusual silence overhead. I've got to say, it's a bit unsettling. It feels a bit like a ceasefire in a war zone. And it leaves me wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, this afternoon, Rico is going to lead us and guide us through some interesting answers to that question with some ideas about what trends will be in the aviation industry and what business models are likely to survive. So um, with great pleasure, I hand over to Rico, um, who is hiding behind his mask. And we'll continue from now. Thank you very much, Susan, for this uh, kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone uh, to this Research Connection webinar on airline strategy in the post-COVID uh, world, uh, where I ask the question whether we are going to back, whether we are going back to the 1960s or perhaps to the future. And um, I'm planning to do this uh, in uh, sort of uh, four stages. First, I would like to remind everyone how uh, important and wonderful aviation was before COVID-19 hit the industry. Uh, we are then going to cover the mess we are uh, uh, sort of in right now. And um, then we will look at some strategic responses that airlines have chosen um, uh, as a response to uh, COVID-19. And um, we will finally then look at uh, what uh, the uh, outlook um, is, is like in my view and um, what strategic response uh, I would recommend um, um, global international airlines to, to adapt. Uh, in all of these sections, I will try and uh, provide you with some examples of my own research. 
um, as I've done quite a, a lot of uh, research in this area and, and aviation is, uh, as you probably can see in the background here, really an industry that I'm very passionate about and um, I could probably talk for hours uh, uh, on this topic and so probably for me the, the challenge uh, this afternoon will be to remain in the 20 minutes that I have been allocated to. to uh, obviously what I will do now is just take off the mask so that you can all hear me a little better. Uh, and so what I would also like to do now is just um, uh, ask you a couple of questions um, uh, that are prepared here to give me a better view of what you think is currently happening and also to make this a little bit more interactive. Because again, this is for uh, the presentation is essentially primarily for um, undergraduate students or students more generally um, that are interested in perhaps our Master of Commerce, our MBA or Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. And uh, you know, this is how we teach at the moment very interactive, a lot of things online, but also on campus and, uh, and, and always um, uh, uh, presenting the latest uh, findings of our uh, research projects. And there are many at the moment um, uh, that involve the uh, global airline and um, global logistics industries. So if I could perhaps um, just ask you to go to menti.com and please answer that question. How many flights have you been on uh, in the last six months. Just give it another 10 seconds or so. Uh, but I think um, a fairly clear picture is sort of emerging here, which is very typical uh, for uh, most people that are currently uh, based in, in Australia. Uh, in Europe, North America, perhaps the picture is a bit different, but here in Australia, very typical that uh, a lot of people uh, won't have been on any plane for the last six months. And that includes me. I used to fly a lot uh, and, uh, and long distance, uh, typically four to five, sometimes six uh, long haul flights and then lots of domestic flights as well each year. Um, but the last six months, uh, none. And so I'm in that camp. Uh, on the left hand side where we have uh, 28 responses so far. So maybe let's look at the next question, which is sort of uh, really important to um, the industry at this point in time. Do you personally think that air travel is a public good that should be supported by national governments through taxes, right, through, through public um, funds? Uh, yes or no? Okay, I think uh, we can sort of leave that here. That's, a, that's actually a bit of a surprise. I would have thought it would be a lot more equal because uh, it seems that there are a lot of people out there that want to fly like crazy, um, but don't really want to pay a lot for it, right? So usually chasing uh, cheap fares all the time and, and really also don't want governments to support airlines, uh, which, uh, well, which you could ask you know, whether that makes sense uh, given that uh, normally public transport, for example, buses, trains, Everyone is happy for those guys to get uh, uh, subsidies or what, as we call it, uh, government procurement involved in, 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 in those organizations. Um, so the government procures that service from, from private companies, but for airlines that doesn't seem to apply. Um, but it, so it's interesting to see that, that you support this view. Um, the majority of people would probably not support that. Now, let's uh, end this um, um, short, uh, uh, survey with a quiz. So it's only one question. And um, the question is, uh, and please answer fast, is my view, and that's me, that people will fly more or less once travel restrictions are lifted? What do you think? What do I think? Okay, time is up. Let's see what you thought. Okay. Equally, that's a wonderful outcome. So 50-50 and uh, quite often, you know, I'm asking myself that same, very same question. And I would like to use the next, uh, say, I think I have still something like 17, 18 minutes uh, left to give you an answer to that question to see whether we come to an answer at the end of my presentation. And uh, that obviously involves uh, some research that we have done. And so let's see what uh, the research is telling us and what the data coming 
from industry uh, is telling us. Okay, so I'm going back to my presentation. And um, as I said, I would like to start just with uh, pointing out how successful aviation has been, right? And so despite lots of exo ex exogenous shocks to that uh, global aviation system, such as 9-11, uh, GFC, uh, SARS, uh, the industry has sort of um, uh, managed to double itself uh, each and every 15 years, right? So there has been a tremendous growth, lots of, uh, you know, interesting uh, prospects, particularly if you're interested in international business and strategy, lots of jobs uh, related to, to airlines, to airports, but also to uh, global supply chains more generally. So what we have seen is that aviation has supported uh, particularly uh, global supply chains um, in the past. And you see that through those correlations here. So volume trades highly correlated with global freight ton kilometers, which is uh, what sort of uh, uh, freight is carried by airlines. We also see that in um, revenue passenger kilometers and how that is linked with the um, uh, PMI index. So, so particularly in business class, um, you know, a lot of activity, a lot of support uh, for various industries. One industry that airlines uh, support in particular is tourism, right? But it's not just tourism, and we actually now see the counterpart or the, 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 the back side of that, is, and that is in Australia. You know, if airlines don't operate to certain areas, uh, to certain regions, say to islands, uh, say uh, Lord Howe Island, uh, the tourism industry really suffers, right? And so, you know, on the other uh, side of the spectrum, if airlines will start flying again, those industry will prosper again. And the same can be said for a lot of supply chain, supply chain jobs. So aviation has always supported a large number of jobs and there are a lot of opportunities uh, in and around that industry. Now with uh, COVID hitting the industry, it has turned out that aviation is actually even more important than a lot of people thought um, in, in, in regards to air freight, right? So I'm, I've always been a fan of aviation, obviously. You know, if I could, this would be sort of my house down here, right? The runway right next to my house, I would love that. Susan has pointed out, maybe that's not always a good idea, particularly if you get the large jets coming in because there's noise involved. Uh, but well, that's me, you know, I just, I'm passionate about the industry. Others have now recognized, oh, hang on, aviation is really important as a, you know, as a sort of backbone that supports all sorts of other industries and keeps economies running. And what has happened with uh, COVID-19 um, uh, is that a large number of countries have uh, put in travel restrictions. So this slide here on the top left shows uh, the number of travel restrictions that are still in place, right? And so this is mid-August. We'll start in March and look where we are still here. Lots of tra travel restrictions all around the place. And what that has meant is that um, not only have um, uh, some customers lost a bit of confidence, but also uh, have airlines had to ground a lot of aircraft. And so we saw a massive drop in passenger volumes and a little bit of a drop in cargo volumes as well. And that is because a lot of the uh, freight is usually carried in the belly hold of passenger aircraft. And if those passenger aircraft don't fly, there's, you know, that capacity is gone. And so the airlines have to um, uh, use uh, what we call dedicated freight aircraft. And those are operating quite, quite a lot, quite intensively. And that part of the business is actually going really well at the moment. So the cargo load factor has gone through the roof since, since COVID-19 hit the industry. Passenger load factor really down, right? So this is where it's really bad. Having said that, not everywhere is bad. Regional airlines in particular here in Australia, but also globally are doing quite okay because they're not so much hit by the travel restrictions. And here in particular, particularly the, the resources sector seems to be still doing okay. And so all these fly in, fly out workers and even some tourism uh, uh, regions seem to be still operating okay. But the large uh, international airlines, they all have ground large parts of their fleets. And in particular, the very large aircraft, such as the 747 or the A380, early retirement or put into the desert where there is less corrosion and hence less need for maintenance, um, you know, all in there. As you can see here, you know, in that picture in the Moyavi Desert uh, in, in, in the US and corners. Um, that obviously poses interesting questions because as an airline, what you normally would do, and this is what we have shown in our research, is that you want to have um, standardized 
uh, fleet. So you want to have as few uh, aircraft types and aircraft engines uh, in your fleet. Now, if you remove you know, certain air type uh, aircraft from your fleet, or if you add once you uh, up, uh, up ramp your, your uh, operations again, do you do that uh, across the board or do you just take certain aircraft types? Uh, you know, how to do that is a very complex and quite challenging question. Now, what has happened also is that the airlines have received quite a bit of support from governments and they had to because uh, what COVID-19 meant to a lot of airlines is a serious cash flow issue, right? People not flying, aircraft grounded. So a lot of uh, expenses that still are ongoing, such as depreciation, uh, wages, all this sort of stuff. And so there, a lot of airlines have been, you know, running into serious cash flow um, uh, problems. And so governments stepped in, in the US, uh, in Europe, here in Australia, and help the industry. But a lot of that money needs to be pay, paid back. And it's quite often also comes with string, strings attached, such as in Europe, where, for example, the French government now wants airlines to look more into uh, high-speed train operations, that sort of stuff. So away from aviation, which is quite often seen as not really environmentally friendly. So a bit of a, a, an issue here. And if we look at strategy and Porter and what he would say, well, he would probably say run, right? because we see in all these, uh, in his five sort of areas where he says, look, this keeps airlines competitive, substitutes, Zoom, right? We all, well, we're doing it now. But people, you know, is there a need to really travel to each and every meeting? Um, not good, you know. Uh, bargaining power of customers are very high at the moment. Uh, bargaining of, supply, uh, of distribution channels, very high at the moment. Threat of new entrants are oh, very, very high. Capital is, uh, is, is still freely available, relatively cheap. Aircraft are cheap because everyone is just storing them or trying to sell them. So possible to have entrants are entering the arena. And so what do you do on all of this? Well, if you have a clear strategy and if you say you want to be a cost leader, as, such as a low cost airline, it's pretty easy. Ryanair, Wizz Air, all these sort of guys are doing pretty well at the moment compared to the full service carriers, such as Corners, Virgin now Contacts, where the question is, or hang on, what do we do? Uh, and are we getting stuck in the middle or are we trying to do too many things? Do we actually offer enough value to our customers to come back? Like in the 30s, you know, where smoking was still allowed in the plane, like, you know, picture it up here. Um, that could be the future. The problem is that um, airlines are seeing at the moment that business class is not flying as much as they used to. So as I said, low cost carriers are doing pretty well, but full service carriers are seeing massive drops in their EBIT margins, and so in their profitability, right? And so it's really tricky and a lot of commentators, a lot of researchers and, and even the airlines themselves ask themselves the question, you know, is that business model broken? Is there a future for airlines? And I would say, well, the future is already here. Because if you look at what a lot of airlines do, they look into data pools and they, um, data oceans, and they try and use that data um, in a much better, much more efficient way as they used to. So essentially air airlines are now turning into data companies that focus very much on loyalty programs and, 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 and just happen to fly some assets around, yeah, you know, some, some, some planes, right? So loyalty seems to be the new thing. And if you look at corners, they have pr pr produced um, sort of not very good results uh, uh, in, the, in the recently uh, uh, published annual report. But if you look at their loyalty program, they're still sitting at an operating margin of nearly 30%. That's fun. That's, that's amazing, right? That's very good profitability despite the challenging times that we are seeing. And so this seems to be where the industry is heading. Having said all that, how do you do that in a freight space? Right? where you have much more business-to-business -business, uh, relationships, much trickier, and we have done some research on that. Um, and, and by the way, I have some, some references in a lot of my slides down here, um, where you can just click on that uh, link down there and you get to the paper. Um, I believe there will be uh, some, some uh, recording made available of this webinar to, to click on this later on. So if you want, and, and by the way, if you have any questions, again, um, please post them to slido.com and, um, uh, and then use uh, connect to and, and post your questions there, which we will attend to after my uh, slides. Of, and I don't have that many more. So we'll come to the questions uh, in a few minutes time. 
So um, loyalty data seems to be the big thing. And there are some positive, you know, some green shirts out there. If you look at consumer confidence, it seems to be going up. And normally what we see is that uh, consumer confidence or PMI or sort of other, in, other indices are linked with uh, air travel, particularly in the business uh, sort of cabins, which is where airlines usually uh, make their money. If we look at one particular market, that is China, we see that aviation has actually recovered. Uh, that said, it's domestic aviation, right? The domestic air travel, and this is the latest data. So this on the left-hand side is it come, come, comes from McKinsey. On the right-hand side, we have uh, data from uh, the Vogue business. And you see the current month, they've actually uh, surpassed the levels of domestic aviation that they had pre-COVID-19, which gives me a lot of confidence that something similar can happen here in Australia and uh, globally in the domestic markets. International, very different ball game, right? Really challenging and um, really different. But here in Australia, lots of opportunities. And if you look at the country and the size of the country, and there's no high-speed rail here, and there won't be for a few years to come, that tells you all you need to do, all you need to know, right? Domestic aviation will, in my view, recover. Even better would be to have more integrated transport, such as um, you know a bus getting you to the airport and then from the airport to say your hotel. So door to door seems to be uh, the winning formula, which is what we see in freight, e-commerce booming um, and, and other uh, sort of uh, door to door business models. We don't really see it yet in passenger uh, transport. And this is where I think the future lies and where airlines can do a lot more to make that happen. Because if you involve door to door with public transport, you also not just becoming more attractive to your customers, but also more environmentally friendly, really good and really important, right? But well, green shirts everywhere, but globally things look still very dire because of a lot of aircraft being grounded. Credit rating agencies have downgraded a lot of airlines. They find it harder to get capital. And a lot of them, if you look at that slide here on the left hand side on the bottom, have cash that only lasts for six more months or so. And remember, in the Northern Hemisphere, winter is coming, right? And winter is usually traditionally the toughest period for airlines. So there is a lot of um, uncertainty out there and a lot of questions as to whether some of the airlines that we know, large international, well-traditional, well-established airlines, whether these guys will survive. What do they do to fight all this? On the right-hand side, we see lots of the care of the passenger airlines go and to use some of the passenger aircraft, even the passenger cabin, for cargo. Turn the passenger aircraft into cargo full freighter aircraft. They also park some of the aircraft. Again, that comes with difficulties, uh, but for quite a lot of them, that's the only option at this point in time because at the center of everything, and it's not so much strategy, it's really just survival and what we call cash flow management. Cash is king, right? Quanta selling pyjamas, selling all sorts of things just to get a bit of cash into the door to survive the next few months because afterwards they think things will improve and will pick up, but they need to get through that critical period at the moment. They're also issuing shares, they get loans, all sorts of things to get just a bit of cash into the door. On the other side, that's much more important, much more strategy related. We have airlines trying to get more confidence into that market, right? So they promise passengers lots of things, uh, face masks, everything is safe, sniffer dogs, uh, you know, picking up COVID, uh, 50 minutes uh, turnaround times for, for, for spontaneous uh, checks at the airports. Um, Emirates paying all sorts of, you know, they give you insurance, pay for all sorts of COVID related costs that you may occur as a result of uh, flight. And last and just, just yesterday, I was in the media um, talking about uh, Honeywell. What they do is they uh, have ultraviolet um, uh, uh, machines going through the aircraft and cleaning them, right? To really have everything spotless in the aircraft. And again, showing that to the market is, 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 is doing one thing and that is providing confidence. Okay, um, so one thing, one larger research project that we have done is to get airlines such as Qantas no longer having to do what we call um, joy flights, flights to nowhere, say to Antarctica or so with no stop, to long haul flights and what we call ultra long haul flights. What that does is you have very long haul flights, say Sydney, London, Sydney, Paris, Sydney, New York, no stop. And it makes those corridors COVID safe in our view. 
because you potentially connect bubble with bubble, or you could also say you avoid large international hubs, which may be COVID infested, right? So that's one of our um, solutions that we present to the industry and, and Fornas and some others are quite interested in that. The big elephant in the room is, uh, is, uh, uh, is the carbon footprint. And again, the industry is currently reinventing themselves and putting a lot of you know, strategic thinking into this. Um, as they say, look, once we ramp up, we want to do this in an environmental friendly way. Um, and uh, perhaps there's hydrogen um, powered aircraft, maybe electric car, uh, electric uh, aircraft or drones, right? So particularly in urban mobility, that seems to be uh, an option. Those you know, longer haul aircraft, they're probably a bit far out in the future because most of these can only do sort of domestic flights at this point in time. But I do think that there will be a future that will Lot, it will be a lot greener and the industry is doing a lot in that space and there will be a future again that will provide a lot of jobs and lots of interesting questions to solve for someone who's studying business um, or logistics management and so I'm looking like Richard Crest here which who's from the CNN and Los Airlines I love airlines too and I look forward to my next flight and hope to see you on board um, somewhere in Australia or wherever we fly globally that brings me to uh, the end of my presentation and I look forward to some questions uh, from, from the floor. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rico. That was fascinating. Um, and uh, at points really encouraging and at other points quite scary. Ultra long haul flights um, sound like a good idea in theory and quite challenging if you're sitting on the plane. Uh, yeah, it depends on the, I, I, I suppose it depends on the class that you're traveling. So yeah. business class will be very nice. Uh, first class is better. <laughs> but, uh, economy. You, you and I, like many others, will be in the economy section. <laughs> so we, we have some great questions here. Um, uh, just going back to the um, comments that you made, in the, and they're quite compelling photographs of parked in the desert. So we're seeing that um, airlines are retiring many of their larger planes, the Airbus A380, which I've got to say is a plane I really love and I'm very sad to see them being retired. Um, so does this, how, how do you think this retirement of large planes is going to play out in this um, revenue sensitive environment? You know, they, these planes carry a lot of passengers as well as being quite, you know, um, not necessarily um, ideal to run in current environments, but maybe later on more economical. What do you think will happen to those big planes? Uh, the 747, that is not going, no, not going to come out of, of the desert because uh, that was sort of uh, get, getting towards retire, retirement uh, anyway, um, even without uh, COVID. And I have to say a lot of things that we see currently in the airline industry is just, uh, you know, with COVID, is that COVID is essentially just accelerating some of those trends. Even the A380 wasn't very popular um, just before um, uh, COVID hit the industry. So Emirates was essentially the only one still uh, accepting and actually they even they counted their last order so the A380 sort of getting you know out of fashion and the reason for that is that uh, you you know you can essentially put something like 500 passengers into those aircraft in each of those aircraft uh, which is great but it also has a risk and that is that you have to fill those seats each and every day right each and every flight and so you only can deploy it on the number of trunk routes and Emirates for them it's great like Sydney, uh, Dubai, Dubai, London, these sort of corridors, great, great aircraft and particularly in economy class, right? Nice heat pitch, I love them too. But for any sort of average airline, you know, they don't have those corridors, those routes. So it's, you know, the capacity is just not there. And so the trend is even before COVID to slightly smaller, more fuel efficient also aircraft, such as the Dreamliner 787 or the A350 of Airbus. Uh, and so I think A380s or big corners, they're not yet retired. Alan Joyce is saying they're in the desert for the next two to three years. Maybe they will never come out. I personally hope they will, but well, the trend is towards slightly smaller aircraft that can fly a little bit farther and more fuel efficient because they only have two engines and just don't carry that risk that you have to fill 500 seats in, on, on each and every flight. Yeah. Um, what do you think, what do you think, we're just looking at the next year, what do you think will be the changes that we see in the coming 12 months, if you were going to pick some? Uh, well, that very much depends on uh, 
the travel restrictions and uh, on whether a vaccine is going to be uh, not only found, but also distributed widely. Uh, so if we have uh, domestic uh, travel restrictions being lifted, so that says uh, the borders within Australia, say New South Wales to Queensland, New South Wales to Victoria, if they are 100% um, you know, uh, open again, that will be great for airlines and particularly for Qantas, Virgin, but also Rex and uh, Alliance, they are now getting into that game as well. They all will, will all be busy ramping up their networks. And so on that side, I think there will be probably even profitable at the end of the next calendar year again. So that looks good if the borders open. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then there will be a lot more um, uh, pain uh, you know, in the domestic aviation industry. And then if you look at the international scene, uh, yeah, even more so. So I think a lot depends on the vaccine. A lot depends on that 15 minute test uh, that they are now distributing globally. So if you can at the airport check whether someone has COVID or is infectious, you know, if you know that, then they, they can board the flight. And so that's good. Um, and so once all these things are there and once demand is there, I think those uh, modern aircraft, again, the Dreamliner A350, they will become, you know, come online again and, and travel will just get back to hopefully, probably not 100%, but 80% of normal. Um, yeah. and, um, and, and then the loyalty thing and the data thing, will, that will, be, will remain. And we will see a lot of innovations on that front as well. So I think the industry, you know, will keep reinventing itself, keep being entrepreneurial. We see lots of innovations. And I think that pressure has not put on the industry has made them realize, okay, we can't just stand still. We need to do more just to keep, you know, yeah. remain in the game. Yeah, which has happened in a lot of sectors, hasn't it? Um, yes. One of the interesting um, trade-offs, which you sort of alluded to there in relation to loyalty programs is, how business travel might change. So these have been a major contributor to programs, but, but now we've all had the experience of doing a lot of remote meetings, um, virtual meetings. So um, do you think that they will, how do you think that's gonna fit into the business model? Um, yes. Aviation industry. Yeah, so that's, that's a big question. That comes back to the slide that I've shown in terms of the broken business model, right? And so a lot of, uh, commentators are saying now with uh, you know online meetings everything zoom uh, there will be much less need of face-to-face uh, -face business meetings right and so there might be some truth in there but i don't think that the need for face-to-face -face communication will entirely go and in fact when i started lecturing uh, you know aviation management this like 10 years ago well there was skype and there was even you know the first start of 3d printing and people were starting to say look uh, this will destroy airlines, right? In five years, there won't be any business travel anymore. What, 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 what have we seen? The opposite. Yeah. You, know, you, you establish new contracts through this all, contacts to, to all this online stuff. And then at some point, you want to fly there, close the deal, want to do it, make it personal, want to have that face-to-face, -face, that you know, cultural interaction uh, yeah. that just stimulates demand, actually. Well, there will be a hit. I'm, I'm pretty sure 10, 20% may be you know, gone forever. But the remaining 80% should still be there, and that will be enough to see airlines, you know, becoming profitable again. Yeah, and I guess that goes to one of the other questions here, which is um, whether the profits for a lot of airlines will be more driven by the domestic market than by the international market. 100%, and that has always been the case, actually, here in Australia. Corners mm -hmm. has always made the profit in the domestic market, international, not really, uh, you know, profitable. And same with other airlines, and particularly now that you have the, you know, the economy class sort of booming, business a little bit fragile now, uh, those carriers that don't have a domestic market, they are probably the ones that are most worried. So the Chinese carriers, domestic, fine. Uh, Corners, I'm sure a long time will be fine. A lot of the US carriers, domestic, fine. But some of those who rely on international, like uh, Cafe Pacific or, or Emirates, they will probably be a bit worried at this point in time. Yeah, so I want to um, jump to a question that comes a bit later down, but that relates quite closely to what you've just been discussing, and which is these major aviation hubs that we have around the world, like Dubai, Singapore, Singapore Hong Kong. What effect do you think that the post-COVID changes might have on those um, hubs? Uh, well, there will be an impact. There has been an impact. Um, they have been very quiet and around, well, particularly around April, May. Um, there have been a seen a big hit and, uh, and I, that actually is, uh, brings me to the point that I made earlier that aviation is not just airlines, right? It's airports, 
is the tourism industries and Emirates. They are propping up the airline primarily to support that 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 uh, business community, uh, you know, in the UAE to uh, support tourism to to have people have a you know a stay over there for two or three days, spend money in hotels and stuff. But if that is gone, that is a big hit for the economy, not just the airline, right? So that needs to be incorporated into the strategy of that airline as well. And they do that quite smartly, in fact. So they will probably see a hit, and particularly if the paper that I've just alerted to, the ultra long haul flights, where they where you can actually bypass those hubs, you know, if that flies, if you know, apologize for the pun there, if that you know becomes reality, then those hubs will have a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, that takes away some of those passengers and that takes away some of those trunk route demand. And um, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, still should be enough for them to keep going. Um, but there will be a hit, I'm pretty sure, to, to some of those hubs. And I've got two questions that also connect with each other here that are quite interesting. And they relate to confidence in, in safety. Not so much the planes falling out of the sky, but our safety in terms of our health if we're going on the plane. So, so um, do you th one question is whether we think cleanliness becoming more important will mean that that the airlines give more time to um, to checking health, to cleaning planes. And, and a related question is, and the other side of the coin really is, how do you build confidence um, that air travel is safe from a health perspective? Um, you know, among people, particularly uh, perhaps among younger customers who've, um, you know, grown up with the COVID pandemic more. Yes. Um, so two, two, two really interesting questions. First of all, I should say that airlines uh, have traditionally been the safest mode of travel, right? If you look at the statistics, yes, whenever there's a big crash, it's all over the media and, uh, you know, in one hit, many people die. It's very tragic, really sad. But if you look at how many planes there are in the air, and it's thousands, right? It's really busy out there in normal times. Um, and how many crashes you have, it's it's remarkable. Qantas never had the fatality, right, in, in its 100-year yeah. history. So mm -hmm. very safe and safety. If you look at um, strategy, safety is right up there. It's number one KPI for airlines. And in Qantas' case, it's part of the brand, right? So if they lose in terms of safety, that is losing part of their value proposition. Not good. And so they make sure that nothing is happening in terms of safety on board of those aircraft. Now with COVID, same, same here. They're cleaning, they're doing all sorts of things to make sure that there is no infection on board. And actually, well, some people believe that it's probably much safer to be on an airplane than in your home because uh, the filter, there's a HEPA filter in the aircon and um, the, the air is blown towards the lower uh, part of the cabin. So you don't breathe if there's a, some virus in the air. It's on the floor. Um, so a lot of people argue that it's actually safe to fly. Well, but you're actually meeting people on the, at the airport, right? So that's also coming back to our paper. Mm -hmm. You interact with people, you do duty free, you, do, you have a check in all these sort of things which are increasingly automated, but you still have interaction with people. And this is where you mm -hmm. could, could contract the, the, the virus. Mm -hmm. Same with traveling on the bus, right? If you have traveled on the bus, um, you know, there are not many people wearing a face mask. People freak out when they're flying, but they're, they board the bus and then no problem there. So mm. it's really to the airlines to build confidence and this is what they're doing at the moment, showing customers, look, this is safe. We have introduced all sorts of measures to make it even safer. And if something happens, there's a fallback, there's an insurance like with Emirates, right? They give you yeah. insurance yeah. that if something yeah. happens, we carry the cost, don't worry. Right? Mm. And so mm. I think this will go a long way and we'll and, and we'll rebuilding confidence. Again, in China, it seems to be working. What they've done is they've issued coupons. So you could buy a coupon and that would enable you to fly as often as you like, say over a weekend, right? Uh, just to build that confidence and it worked. So I'm pretty confident it will work in other markets as well. Yeah, in that sense, fact I'm, is uh, most of us just love traveling. and. Uh, and for Australians, for sure. Some yeah. assurance and, and get going again. And family and friends, right? Don't forget yeah, that. Yeah, totally yeah. important. Yeah, yes. most of us know someone or ourselves have been restricted from, you know, an important event or contact with someone who's sick. All of these things are really important. What, what advice, if any, would you have for travel agents? Um, they're, they're quite in the middle of this. Yes. So, oh, yeah, travel agents. Good question. Um, Go online is the first thing. You need to have an online presence, right? <laughs> because a lot of this stuff is done via contactless, seems to be the big uh, thing at the moment, that uh, 
also, uh, same with the alarms, you know, tell your clients, uh, and I'm pretty sure that the demographics of travel agents are more sort of elderly people, right, who love cruises, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, that's another fascinating industry, which, uh, yeah. you know, it amazes me that they are still around, to be honest, but there are. So there seems to be a demand. Mm -hmm. And again, just building confidence again and making sure that protocols are followed in terms of safety. Uh, and communicating that this is happening is, I think, the main thing for these guys. And, and, and for travel agents, probably more so than for airlines, cash preservation, right? Try yeah. and make sure you don't run out of cash before this is all, uh, you know, over. Mm. That would be the main advice, cash yeah. management. <laughs> we just, we, we all really want this to come to an end sooner rather than later. Well, to some extent, we are in a similar boat, right? With the, yeah. <laughs> many universities, you know, just make sure exactly. you know, cash and hopefully get somehow through this and then yeah. come you know out stronger at the other end more innovative better positioned yeah. but you know it's easier said than done of course that's uh, right we we probably need to wind up but i i just want to um finish with with a uh, perhaps um rico you could volunteer to respond to some of these slider questions um, i'm not sure if kath can facilitate that but perhaps we can do that some other way but there's one that really intrigues me here um with dampened passenger demand but cargo demand remaining high will we see a return to combi aircraft yeah, so that's uh, so combi aircraft are sort of uh, aircraft that you can fairly easily convert between passenger and, and cargo, and some airlines have that those aircraft. Um, quite possible. Uh, the question is then, you know, how long is this uh, pandemic going to last, and is yeah. it worth the investment? So mm -hmm. what I would do as an airline, I would probably not uh, purchase such an aircraft, but I would lease it for the next six months, right? So you just lease it, and then maybe after the six months, you just do another six. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and that will not really drive, uh, you know, too much of the demand for those sort of aircraft. It will not, you know, obviously, it's, if it does, that would be great for aircraft manufacturers, such as Boeing and Air, uh, Airbus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But I think most airlines would say, look, this is a temporary thing, and at some point we will get passenger aircraft back and that very hold capacity coming onto the market yeah. again. Yeah. Which, in fact, it does to some extent. If you look at Emirates, Qatar, they're all flying into Australia already. Um, and I think they will increase the capacity uh, a lot once the travel restrictions are lifted. Mm. Yes, bring it on. Well, thank you so much, Rico. It's been an absolutely fascinating webinar. And thank you, everyone, for joining in and for your really great questions. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you here um, this afternoon.